thank you so much for everyone joining us here. Um, I, and especially in this trying time uh, that I all know you're in. Uh, and I'm so uh, happy to have you join us for this new philosophy faculty series on climate ethics. So my name is Alice Evert and I'm a DPhil student in the Faculty of Philosophy and I work on climate ethics. I'm also the outreach director for the Oxford Climate Society, which is a student run society in Oxford dedicated to building up climate learning and thinking and action across the university who are currently working with the university to uh, in implement net zero policies, as well as get climate onto the curriculum. Uh, so this series brings together uh, some of the leading experts in climate ethics. We've got John Broom, Megan Blomfield, Simon Caney and Henry Shu, and they're gonna be showcasing some of the latest work in the area on climate ethics. And I hope this series will spark interest both in questions dealing with climate change and philosophy and demonstrate the role that philosophy has to play in driving climate thinking, action and discussion. The, so we're very lucky today to be joined by Professor John Broom, uh, who is Emeritus White's Professor of Moral Philosophy here at Oxford. He has expertise uh, in economics and philosophy and has written extensively about the moral perspective on climate change from topics including our duties to offset carbon emissions, what we owe to future generations, and how we can motivate government action on climate change. He was one of, uh, uh, he was an author and one of two philosophers on the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is the leading authority on climate science and advises governments across the world. And he was uh, also a contributor to the Stern Review uh, of Economics on Climate Change. So he's going to be talking to us about some of his latest work on self-interest against climate change. What will happen is uh, Professor Broom will first present his talk, which should go for approximately 45 to one hour. And then the floor will be open to questions and discussion from the audience. I encourage you to write any questions you have in the right hand side of the chat on YouTube live stream. And over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you all from com for coming. Um, I gather that you're mostly getting this on, on live streaming through YouTube. So I'm afraid I can't see most of you. Um, I'll have to rely on Alice to tell me if anything goes wrong with the transmission. And first, I must particularly thank Alice, who has organized this series of talks um, from Sydney, uh, where it is now the middle of the night. So I think we should particularly appreciate that she stayed up so long in order to try and in order to manage this uh, um, seminar. So first, let me see if I can get my slides going. Um, and uh, Alice, I hope you will tell me if they aren't um, as they should be. Um, I hope they look okay now, and you can now read my uh, first, um, my introductory slide. I'm assuming that's so, and that you can hear what I'm saying, because I can see. John, every everything is looking perfect. That's working. Okay, okay thanks very much, Janelle. You know. Well, I'm starting with a picture of uh, jubilation. This is a jubilation among the delegates at the uh, 215 uh, Paris meeting on, on climate change. Uh, this one actually is uh, Nick Stern, the author of the Stern Review. Um, and what they're jubilating at is that pretty much all the nations of the world had just agreed to uh, this agreement. This agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above uh, pre-industrial levels. Well, that was the agreement. Um, but Despite having agreed to it, uh, many of the nations 
um, didn't mean what they said. To take just one example, uh, within days uh, after the Paris Agreement, the UK government drastically cut the subsidy it paid for installing social, solar panels. It also issued licenses for fracking in many parts of England with the aim of opening up new reserves of fossil fuel. And still within days of this agreement, it removed the tax advantage that it had previously uh, given to low emission cars. Three things which contribute to promoting climate change and yet before the, 19, the 2015 uh, meeting, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had made it quite plain that the two degree target, uh, even the two degree target, let alone the 1.5 degree target, could not be met except by means of the most stringent measures uh, to, to control emissions. And obviously the British government had no intention of making stringent me measures. It had no intention of doing as it had promised. Our government continues to make promises to cut emissions and it continues to claim credit for doing so. So you'll remember that in June 2019, it announced a new more stringent target of net zero for UK emissions by uh, 2050. This was not long before it cut, uh, removed the final subsidy for installing solar panels. And only in the next, the one month later, its own independent committee on climate change sent a scathing report to Parliament describing how far the government had already fallen behind in the effort that was needed to achieve even its previous less stringent target. It had completed just one of the 25 measures that the, the committee, committee had recommended to it one, one year earlier. So the British government is not doing what it needs to do. And there's not very much sign that the world as a whole is taking serious notion of the Paris uh, Agreement. Greenhouse gas is still growing. It does seem to have slowed a little bit through, since 2015, or it did for a year or two after 2015, and, but it seems to have picked up again thereafter. Of course, this is a special year when it almost certainly will shrink but that's for uh, other, other reasons. Um, in support of this two, 2015 agreement, countries made pledges to the United Nations uh, to reduce their emissions. Even all those pledges taken together uh, are still not enough to uh, achieve the, the, the target, the, the, the two degree target, um, even if they were all fulfilled, the, it's still estimated that there would be 2.8 degrees of climate change before 2100. This is according to Climate Action Tracker, which gives you this picture of where we are at. Um, here is the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees. Here is naught degrees, the pre-industrial average. That's the goal. Uh, this is what the pledges made by the countries will get us to about 2.8 uh, degrees. Sorry, this is the 1.5 degree goal. This is the two degree goal here. We'll get us to about 2.8 degrees. And in any case, um, few nations have policies which are even uh, meeting their um, uh, pledges. So current policies are expected to go to about three degrees by 2100. And nothing says that the warming is not going to continue after 2100. So the signs are pretty bad that the, gov that the world is doing much about uh, climate change. I'm going to give another example of egregious inaction on climate change. Uh, I could have chosen the US as an example. I could have chosen Brazil as an example, but actually I decided to pick on Australia. Australia has more emissions per capita uh, than even the United States. And that doesn't take into account the contribution that Australia is making to climate change by exporting 380 million tons of coal every year. Last year in December, at the 
um, Madrid meeting of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, Australia joined the United States and Brazil as one of the villains of the uh, meeting. Um, Australia's particular villainy uh, was to cheat on its figures. It had pledged to reduce its emissions to between 28, 26 and 28 degrees below their 2005 level by 2030. This is a very mo modest target. Here is a picture of um, Australia's history. This black line shows its emissions in the past. This blue line shows what its emissions are projected to be on its, um, uh, on its present policies. This down here is its 2030 target that it pledged to the United Nations. You can see that this is a very modest target because it still um, uh, allows for emissions that are greater than they were in 1990. Whereas if you compare the, United, the European Union, for example, the EU has pledged to reduce its emissions below the 1990 level by 40%. So Australia's target is um, uh, extremely modest. And what it did at um, Madrid to announce, was announce that in order to meet its targets, it was going to count in its calculation something we should call Kyoto credits. Now, these are things that were something to do with the Kyoto Agreement, have no place at all in the Paris Agreement, are not recognized in the Paris Agreement. Um, they are, in effect, mean that Australia is planning to double count some of its reductions uh, in emissions. And this maneuver was universally recognized as simply uh, uh, cheating. Moreover, although the Australian government is on track, as it says, claims that it's on track, um, to meet its emission target at a canter, there is no evidence at all for this claim. Um, Australian emissions have been increasing since 2013, which is when the uh, uh, coalition government repealed Australia's existing um, uh, carbon price uh, mechanism. They've been increasing steadily since then. There is no sign that they are turning over. So Australia's attitude is extremely unhelpful. And the striking thing about it is that it's one of the countries that's most vulnerable to climate change. Australians live on the fringes of a hot, dry continent, which is expected to become hotter and drier. They've always suffered droughts. Um, but at the time of the, the Madrid deep meeting, many areas of Eastern Australia were enduring the worst drought that had ever been recorded. While the Australian delegates in Madrid were prevaricating about their target, back home, Australia was on fire. Here is one of the Australian fires. This is down in Gippsland in uh, Eastern um, uh, Victoria. Um, uh, a few weeks after the Madrid summit, this particular fire drove about a thousand people onto the beach and they had to live on the beach for a week before the Navy came and rescued them. It was like a wartime evacuation that happened in, in Victoria. We sometimes assume that when things get bad enough, as they plainly were in Australia, our governments will eventually take action. But uh, the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who was forced to return to Australia from a secret holiday that he took in Hawaii while Australia was burning, said, this is how he worded it, that he would not be pushed by environmentalists, greenies, that's to say, into making what he called reckless cuts to the coal industry. Uh, Australia climate change policy remains unaltered, even though a poll that was taken in November last year, before the fires really grow, grew to cataclysmic proportions, which happened around the end of November, even though that poll, in, in, end of December, 
even though the poll in November showed that two thirds of Australians, even then, favoured a stricter policy on climate change, um, the uh, Australian government did nothing. And now, of course, the majority is in favour of doing something that's much greater, but still, the government is doing nothing. Um, why? Well, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. It's because of the tremendous power of the coal industry in Australia. Coal is Australia's second largest export, and it employs roughly 35,000 people. Indeed, the government, the Australian government, is still doing its best to open a new coal mine in Queensland, which would be one of the biggest coal mines in the world. So it's doing nothing about climate change. Interestingly, on the other hand, the Australian government has so far been extremely successful in dealing with coronavirus. It's, it's worked hard on that and been successful. What's the difference? Well, one difference at least is that there are no powerful uh, interests opposing strong action against the government. Most of the Australian interests seem to be in favour of saving lives from the coronavirus, whereas the coal industry is very much against doing anything about climate change. Well, I'm reminding you of these depressing facts uh, uh, about action on climate change um, for two reasons. The first is to make it clear that the international effort to bring climate change under control is failing. I think we can say that it has failed. That effort has been in train since at least the Rio Earth Summit, which took place in 1992. Um, we're now almost 30 years later, and emissions of greenhouse gas in the world as a whole are continuing uh, to soar. They've diminished in one or two countries, but only a very few countries have adopted policies that are commensurate with the challenge that we face. So I think it's plain that we've got to do something different. The existing approach is not work. The existing approach has rested on what's basically a moral appeal. Because of the greenhouse effect, our emissions of greenhouse gas are causing great harm to other people, and particularly those are people who are not yet born or future generations. On moral grounds, therefore, it's obvious that we should reduce uh, emissions. The Stern report, for example, this came out in 2006, a long time ago now, recommended us, that's to say the current generation, to sacrifice a small amount of our consumption because it calculated that a small sacrifice in the present would bring much greater benefits uh, in the future. The benefits would greatly outweigh the sacrifice. However, those benefits would mainly accrue to future generations, whereas it's the present generation that has to make the sacrifice. So why should we do it? Why should we do what Stern recommended? Well, it can only be because we accept a moral responsibility towards future people. So that was an appeal to our morality. And now, more recently, we have a very strong moral appeal from Greta Thunberg. She makes the same moral demand. She does so with much more force and indignation because she's a great orator and also a representative of the generations that we older people are harming by our emissions. How dare you, she said. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, we say we will never forgive you. Well, she's right, of course. Uh, climate change is a great moral wrong perpetrated by some people on others, and in particular by the old and the young. So she's absolutely entitled to her indignation. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that this moral appeal is mistaken or incorrect. Our emissions 
are moral failings. And I do also think these are things that need to be said very loudly, because whatever happens, our governments are going to need to be pushed into action against climate change, and protests on the streets are a powerful way of applying pressure. However, I do think that the appeal to morality is not so effective that it can achieve its aim of bringing climate change under control. To do that, to control climate change, we need to go beyond morality to a different approach. Many individual people are moved by the appeal to morality. Many of us are willing to make the sacrifice for the sake of future people. Uh, many of the moral philosophers who work on climate change aim to persuade us to live an environmentally more virtuous life. And many of us do as they recommend. We insulate our houses, we eat less meat, we reduce our travel and so on. However, I think that individual morality will never solve the problem of climate change just because not enough people are going to do as morality requires. And moreover, in order to reduce our emissions substantially, even if we're trying to do that, we need big changes in our economic infrastructure. And as individuals, we're not in a position to make those uh, changes. So to solve the problem of climate change, not just individuals, but governments have to act. Governments have coercive power. They've got the power to impose regulations and impose taxes to make sure that everyone responds as they should do to climate change, not just the few people who are mo motivated by uh, morality. So they have the power to do it, whereas we as individuals don't. However, on the other hand, many governments are impervious to morality. And that's the second point that I wanted to draw from the sad stories that I told you about Britain and Australia. Um, governments prevaricate, they tell lies, they cheat, they make promises that they have no intention of keeping and they really don't care about the future. It's true that to some extent, governments are responsive to the moral motivations of their people, but not to uh, a great enough extent. Um, democratic governments are supposed to be responsive, but nevertheless, even though most Australian people, a very large majority now of Australian people, would like their government to take action on climate change, it takes no notice. It's more influenced by the coal lobby than it is by the electorate. And the largest emitter of greenhouse gas is China, which is not even a democracy anyway. I think I conclude that, that so long as there are powerful interests opposed to controlling climate change, governments, our governments are not going to act as they ought to. Morality will never motivate us. So the only way we can achieve a satisfactory outcome, I think, is to make sure that it's in no one's interest to oppose action. I think this is what we should now aim for. We should not ask anyone to sacrifice her interest for moral reasons, because probably she won't. If we can do this, appeal to people's self-interest, we can harness that powerful motive to drive action on climate change. And the first main point that I want to make is that this can be done. Climate change can be controlled in a way that requires no one to make any sacrifice. And by that, I mean no one, not even the owners of fossil fuel resources and workers in the coal mine. None of them need to suffer from action we take to reduce climate change. Now, I expect that'll come as quite a surprise to many of you because the moral approach has been pursued for so long that we're used to thinking the current generation has to make the sacrifice. We've been asked to for decades, but actually it's not so. 
so much good will be done by bringing climate change under control that there's enough good to go around everybody uh, and leave no one uh, worse off. All that's required is that all this benefit that can be achieved should be uh, properly distributed uh, around the people. If we did say, make a sacrifice of our current consumption for the sake of uh, cleaning up the atmosphere, most naturally, the benefit for that would accrue to people in the future. But we can redistribute some of that benefit backwards in time to us. And we can do that well enough to compensate us fully for the sacrifice that we initially make. So there will need to be redistribution between generations, and there'll also have to be redistribution within a generation from those who benefit from reducing climate change to, to those who do not benefit uh, from doing it, such as the owners of fossil fuels. But it can be done once the redistribution is put in place. And I'll come later to how that can be done. But first, let me say how I know this. I know it from economic theory. Economic theory um, tells us it is so because greenhouse gases are what economists call an um, externality. When you do something that causes an emission of greenhouse gas, the gas spreads around the world and does harm everywhere in the world and over a very long stretch of time. And that harm, all of that harm is part of the cost of what you do when you emit the uh, greenhouse gas. But you don't bear all of that cost. Uh, a lot of the cost is borne by all the people around the world who suffer by the consequences of your greenhouse um, gas emission. It's what's called an external cost. So when deciding what to do, whether to do some activity or not, you don't take into account in your decision-making all of the costs because many of those costs are external and for um, other people. And the consequence of that is a particular sort of uh, inefficiency within the economy. It's actually wasteful in economic uh, terms. According to the very standard economic theory, it's what's called a Pareto inefficiency. Uh, a situation is defined to be Pareto inefficient if it would be possible in principle to change things within the economy in uh, a way that makes somebody, at least one person, better off without anyone ending up worse off. That's to say, it could be a change which benefits some people without asking for a sacrifice from uh, anybody. And according to standard economic theory, um, uh, an externality such as greenhouse gas normally makes our situation Pareto inefficient. So according to the standard theory, it's possible to respond to climate change in a way that makes at least one person better off without making anyone worse off. No sacrifice is required from anybody. That's what the elementary economics says. And um, I have to confess that I used to say it, and many economists actually still do say it. However, it's not actually true because the standard elementary economic theory does not apply to externalities of the thought, sort that we're talking about, which is to say intergenerational externalities, externalities where the external cost falls on people in later generations. Intergenerational externalities do not fall within the theory. The, the external intergenerational external cost invalidates the theory. The reason for that is that whatever we do about climate change, it will alter the makeup and almost certainly the size of the world's future population. Action on climate change will have to be dramatic action and it will make a difference to the development, the evolution of the world's human population. Uh, if, for instance, our government makes any, takes any serious action on climate change, it's bound to alter the way that we live our lives. It will make it harder and more expensive to travel, that will alter the way society works, people will live more locally, they will meet and have babies with different people from those they would have met and had babies with, 
I have babies at different times and they're probably not exactly have exactly the same number of babies. So the result is that the next generation would be made up of different people and different numbers of people from those who would have lived had our governments done nothing about climate change. So future generations will be altered in their makeup, in their identity and their number. And that means that standard economic theory does not apply. It applies only when there's a fixed population of people with fixed preferences. I can illustrate that um, by using an exaggerated example. It's not meant to be particularly plausible. I'm only using it as a counter example to show that the theory can deliver false conclusions. Um, suppose that for some uh, reason, the government's climate change policy caused the birth of more people for whom it's harder to have a good life. You can imagine how that might happen. Here's, here is a sort of rather remote possibility. Um, less travel might mean more inbreeding. Um, uh, uh, so um, people might be born with more birth defects. And then the policy will not be able to ensure that the members of future generations are better off than they would otherwise uh, have been. So the theory needs to be repaired. But still, fortunately, the conclusions are slightly altered. True, the theory can be repaired. What we have to do is adopt a different notion of efficiency from Pareto efficiency. It needs to be one that's not based on the well being of future people, how well off those people are, that's to say, but on the resources that are available to future people. We can say that uh, a situation is inefficient. If it's possible to change things in the economy so that some existing people are better off and no existing people are worse off, and the resources that are passed to people in future generations are just as good as they, as they were. Um, and it turns out that externalities, including intergenerational externalities, cause inefficiency in this different sense, the sense that cares about resources for people in the future rather than future people's well-being. The theory can, can therefore be um, revived. It means that climate change can in principle be controlled in a way that makes no presently living person worse off and leaves future generations with just as good resources as they would have had. And in that sense, Responding to climate change requires no sacrifice. I do need to stress, though, again, that doing so, controlling climate change without sacrifice, will require some redistribution of resources between people. And that includes redistribution between generations. And I'm going to say uh, again um, how we can implement a, a no sacrifice policy by intergenerational redistribution. Before I come to that, uh, I, I want to um, lay, my, um, uh, lay down my own view about this, which is um, that I think our approach to climate change policy should be constrained by the condition that it requires no sacrifice. So we should aim to find a way of dealing with climate change that does not ask anybody to make a sacrifice in order um, to do it. Since controlling climate change will produce a great deal of, of, um, of benefit, um, even accepting that constraint, we will still um, have choices uh, available to us. And that means that we can decide where the surplus benefit uh, goes, um, and we can distribute the surplus benefit um, to make, um, if we like, present people better off or alternatively redistribute it to give better resources to future people. We have choices of that sort. But still, there are two strong objections that could be made to the no sacrifice um, condition, which uh, I am um, proposing. Um, the first objection is that it will leave the world with uh, economic maldistribution, uh, as it could be called. And second, it will perpetuate injustice uh, in the world. And I'll respond to both of those objections in turn. They're both 
important objections and in a way good objections, but um, uh, I think we should, we will have to overrule them. Uh, the objection of maldistribution um, first. Um, it's natural to think that if we do accept the no sacrifice constraint, our um, uh, policy on climate change should aim at the best possible result within that constraint. That's to say we should aim at doing the greatest good in the world under the constraint that we do not ask for a sacrifice from anybody. That seems a very plausible aim for us uh, to achieve. And um, that includes trying to make the best distribution of wealth and income within generations and between generations constrained under the no sacrifice constraint. But the no sacrifice constraint will prevent us from achieving the very best result. We can achieve the best subject to the constraint, but the constraint will not allow us to achieve the very best distribution uh, of good uh, in the world. The constraint limits us in what we can do, so it implies some maldistribution. Therefore, the constraint implies maldistribution, and that's the objection. Two sorts of maldistribution. There's an intergenerational one and an intragenerational uh, sort of maldistribution. I'll start with the intergenerational sort. Several economists have calculated how much effort should go into dealing with uh, climate change if what we do is aim for the best result overall. So the aim of the economists is, is, is to try and maximize a value function, which is some aggregate of the well-being of the people uh, in the world, including present and future people. They try and maximize their value function. It's debatable what their value function should be. I mean, we debate often about whether it should give less value to future people. Um, but um, that form uh, doesn't matter here. What matters is that the conclusion of the maximizing exercise, which they do, is generally that the very best result for the world involves the present generations making a sacrifice uh, in order to improve things for the future generation. The best intergenerational distribution implies some sacrifice of the well being of the present for the future. For those of you who are schooled in economics, I just put up this diagram which illustrates this. It illustrates distribution between the present generation's consumption, future generation's consumption. This is a possibility frontier. If you don't understand the economics, don't worry about this. But for those of you who do, there's a possibility frontier. Here is our present position, business as usual, which is inefficient. That's to say it means it's below the possibility frontier. Um, if we go to the best possible distribution, well, that can be worked out on the basis of the value function. And I put into this picture a value contour. And the best possible distribution within the possibilities of the possibility constraint, possibility frontier, is here, where the future gen generation is consuming more than it does under business as usual, and the present generation is consuming less. So the best distribution involves a sacrifice taking, uh, reducing the consumption of the present generation and increase in the consumption of the future generation. If that's all gobbledygook for you, don't worry. Um, we just um, so, uh, the best solution to the climate change problem will involve the sacrifice of the present for the future. And the objection is that the constraint, the no sacrifice constraint, pre prevents that. But that's where we started. For almost 30 years, we've been trying to urge the present generation to make a sacrifice for the sake of the future. And the economic models, such as the Stern Review, all they do is they show that that would make the world better. But we know that that appeal hasn't worked. The present generation, as represented by our governments, will not make that sacrifice. And that's why I'm now recommending a different approach. We have to accept that we're not going to achieve the best intergenerational distribution because the best intergenerational distribution is not practically achievable. What about intergenerational mal maldistribution? Well, the world is grossly unequal. Um, in recent decades, um, climate change has exacerbated this inequality. 
because it's mostly better off people who gain benefit by emitting greenhouse gas and mostly worse off people who suffer from the consequences. And this inequality is undoubtedly a very bad thing. So if we choose our climate change policy with the aim of producing the best results, the policy we choose will involve some redistribution from better off to worse off people, because that is the way to make a way to make the world better, redistribute from the better off to the worse off. And if we impose a no sacrifice constraint, that will be prevented. We will be prevented from taking wealth and income from the better off and, and letting it go to the less well off people. So the distribution will end off uh, worse off than it would have been without the constraint. And this is within our generation. This will be um, the distribution between the present rich and the present poor. But again, all I can say is that that can't be helped because the rich people will not accept a sacrifice or their government will not accept uh, a sacrifice. The world is beset by more than one terrible problem. Climate change is one. Inequality is another, and they don't all have to be solved at the same time. I don't think we should saddle our response to climate change with the additional task of being a response to inequality, because if we do, we'll end up with no successful response to either. If climate change was the cause of intergenerational inequality, sorry, let me start that again. If climate change was the cause of intergenerational inequality, it might be right to tackle those two problems uh, together. But in fact, it's not the cause of it. The world's inequality results from centuries of unequal economic development and from centuries of colonialism. Uh, climate change is much too recent a phenomenon to have made much difference, had much effect on the inequality uh, in the world. So in sum, the problem of maldistribution is bad, but we just have to accept it because of the failure of the appeal to morality. Now to the second objection, which is injustice. Maldistribution is often referred to as distributive injustice, but that's not what I meant by mal, but that's not what I mean by injustice. What I mean by the problem of injustice is different from maldistribution. When you do harm to another person, you do her an injustice. It's a matter of common sense. You're doing a moral wrong to somebody if you harm her, unless there is some excusing consideration. For example, if you do it in self-defense or with the person's consent, shall we say. Our emissions of greenhouse gas do harm to other people, and there are no exculpating circumstances. They haven't consented to it, um, and we're not doing it in self-defense and so on. So they are just simply unjust. And if we accept a no sacrifice response to climate change, we'll do nothing to overcome that injustice. And injustice is being done, and we won't overcome it. So that's the objection. Well, it's a correct objection. Um, suppose that a bully regularly inflicts unjust harm on other people. Now suppose the bully is paid to stop doing this harm. The harm stops, and that's good for the victims. And the bully is better off because she's been paid. Um, so everybody is better off, the victims because they're no longer being harmed, and the bully because she's been paid. But the justice has not been overcome. The bully has put herself in a position of advantage by means of her bullying, by harming other people. And now she's being paid, that payment simply perpetuates the advantage that she unjustly got over other people. So it perpetuates the injustice rather than overcoming it. And the no sacrifice constraint is like that. Those who emit greenhouse gas are unjustly advantaging themselves by their emissions, inflicting harm on others for their own benefit. Under a no sacrifice policy to control climate change, they're paid enough to make it worth their while to stop their emissions. So their unjust advantage is perpetuated by this policy. Now, amongst the people who cause emissions, the people I'm talking about, emissions of greenhouse gas, many of us do so innocently 
without realizing the harm that we're doing. But there are also many who do it knowingly. Some do it knowingly on an extremely large scale and some do everything they can to continue the harm. I'm thinking of the leaders of the fossil fuel industry. Several of them are bad people. They tell lies and they pay others to tell lies in order to preserve their unjust advantage by continuing to cause emissions of greenhouse gas. Justice requires them to be punished, but under a no sacrifice policy, they will actually be rewarded. I think this is the worst feature of a no sacrifice policy. It sticks in the gullet, but I think we have to swallow it. These people, like the Australian coal lobby, have the power to stop us from controlling climate change. They're holding us to ransom, and I'm sorry to say that we have to pay the ransom. I think it's awful, but I think it has to be accepted. So now I come to a practical question. I claimed on purely theoretical grounds that a no-sacrifice policy is possible. But you might very reasonably wonder how, in practice, it can be possible. I said that since the natural benefits of controlling climate change um, accrue to future generations, a no-sacrifice policy will involve transferring those benefits back to presently living people. And you might wonder, how can benefits be transferred backwards in time from the future to the present? Well, actually, that's not as puzzling as it may sound. We transfer ben benefits backwards by not transferring benefits forwards. We people in the present generation are in control of the world's resources, in control of the resources that will in time become available to future people. We consume some of those resources and we pass the rest of them along to people in the future. So we could, if we choose, hang on to more of them for ourselves. We could hold back more of them for ourselves, and that's a way of transferring benefit from them back to us. Now, a no-sacrifice policy does not require um, us to hold back more resources in total from people in the future. In fact, we will end up transferring more resources to the people in the future do it that way, what it requires us to do is change the nature of the resources that we pass to people in the future. Each year, the economy produces some income. We, the present people, consume some of that income, and we invest some of it for the future. As it happens, most of the investment we make takes the form of conventional capital goods including economic infrastructure such as buildings, roads, power distribution networks, and so on. And quite a lot of those goods survive for a while and constitute resources that we leave to future people. But we could instead bequeath to our descendants. Um, oh, yeah. But as well as that, um, when we leave them uh, those uh, artificial resources, we also, as things are at present, bequeathed to them a dirty atmosphere. We're dirtying up the atmosphere in the course of doing our consumption and investment. It would be preferable for them. It would be a better lot of resources that they get if we leave them less of the conventional capital and instead a cleaner atmosphere. Instead of leaving them material um, solid resources, we, the resource that we leave to them more of is a clean atmosphere. And we can achieve that simply by changing the nature of our investment. Instead of investing in conventional goods, we can make green investment instead. We can insulate our houses, build windmills and solar farms, build bike paths, uh, and so on. So we can do green investment instead of our existing conventional investment. And that will leave the future with greater resources, better resources in total. On a very crude picture of the situation, this requires merely a switch in the sort of investment. 
It doesn't require any increased overall investment, so it seems no sacrifice would be required from us because we could keep our consumption as it was. You might think that if the world had a planned economy, and the world government that was in charge of investment uh, throughout the world, it could simply, by command, switch the investment from conventional form to green uh, investment. In our actual world, investment is not controlled by a world government, it's controlled by mainly capitalists. So the switch in the nature of um, investment would have to be organized in a more difficult way through the world's financial system. The capitalists who are at present doing conventional investment would have to be persuaded to stop doing it. And that can be achieved by government borrowing. Governments could issue bonds making the interest rate so attractive that the capitalists would prefer to buy those bonds rather than invest in building conventional capital goods. They would willingly, those interest rates would link to the government, which could then spend the money on green investment. So that's the way the investment could be shift, switched in a capitalist economy. But that is definitely oversimplistic. Um, what we have from the economic theory is a conclusion that a no sacrifice result is possible. But that doesn't tell us that we can achieve it without any alteration in our consumption. To achieve a no sacrifice result, the economy has to be reasonably efficient, whereas switching investment without changing consumption would be inefficient because our present investment is geared to our present consumption. There will have to be, I think this is obvious, more profound changes than a mere switch in the nature of the investment. We're going to have to consume different things, greener things, things that involve less carbon in their production. But what the theory does tell us is that our consumption can be altered in a way that does not make any of us worse off. We will be consuming different things, but different things that are just as good at it for us as the present dirty things that we uh, consume. So we are not expected to make a sacrifice when we switch our consumption. As any economist knows, when we're dealing with an externality, we can't hope for efficiency unless the economy, the externality, as, as they say, internalized. As I explained, an emission of greenhouse gas has an external cost, which the emitter doesn't take into account when choosing to emit. If she's to take that into account properly in making her decisions, she herself is going to have to bear a cost for making the emission, but it is equal to her external cost. And that's what internalizing the externality means. Make the emitter bear the, the same cost as the external cost. That means there has to be a price for emitting carbon uh, a greenhouse gas that's equal to the external cost of emitting it. What economists know is that a carbon price of that sort is essential if we're to achieve any reasonable efficiency, and we need to achieve reasonable efficiency if we're to avoid sacrifice. We generally call this a carbon price, although it's all greenhouse gases have to be, have to be priced, but for simplicity, we generally call this a carbon price. Uh, there needs to be a price on uh, emissions of carbon. There has to be one. There are various different ways of creating one, but the simplest is by means of a tax the government can impose a carbon tax. That gives an incentive for consumers to start consuming less carbon intensive goods and consume, yes, to start consuming less carbon intensive uh, goods. And if the tax is right, then it's going to move us towards efficiency. We have to consume less carbon intensive goods and the ta tax will provide us with the necessary incentive to do so. So the tax could move us towards that sort of efficiency, but it's not going to make everybody better off by itself. Um, the tax is going to hurt the present emitters of carbon dioxide, and that predominantly means present people. If we have to start paying tax for our emissions, yes, we can reduce our emissions, but we still will be emitting and we're therefore being hurt 
um, by the tax. Future people will be benefited because they will have a cleaner atmosphere, but present people will be hurt by that tax. So if the result is that nobody is to make a sacrifice, then somehow people have to be compensated for paying that carbon tax. How can that be done? Well, it's a matter of redistribution. And it's ultimately a matter of redistribution from future people to present people. Somehow, the future people have to compensate the present people by paying them um, compensation for um, paying the carbon tax. It's a redistributive tax. So in effect, governments will have to tax future people in order to pay the tax, compensate, subsidize present people. But how can governments tax future people? Well, the answer to that is easy. They can do it by um, borrowing. A government debt is in effect a commitment to raise taxes on future people. The government, uh, the government, um, The government can sell this commitment, the commitment to raise tax in the future, in the form of bonds and use the revenue it raises by selling it to compensate uh, present people to the extent of them make, making them know what's up from before. Um, how already, it will already have available in order to compensate present people for the tax, the revenue that it raises itself by the, the carbon tax. Remember that the carbon tax is actually rather an effective revenue raising tax. So there will be some revenue available to compensate the present people for paying uh, it, but it will need also to borrow by means of selling bonds, which in effect passes tax through to future people in order to compensate people in the present. How um, uh, can it actually do the compensation for present people? It can raise the revenue to do it by selling bonds? Well, um, reducing other taxes is a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, reducing income tax will do it for most people. Income tax is a pretty inefficient sort of tax. Reducing income tax uh, by enough will be enough to, um, to compensate them. Um, there will also have to be big subsidies to shareholders and workers in the fossil fuel uh, industry. And that will be a big call on the, on the results of the government lending. Um, I have now at this point to confess that unfortunately, in practice, governments can't target exactly the right amount of compensation to each individual. They're only able to deal with broad classes of people, so they can compensate, shall we say, shareholders, and they can compensate workers in the coal industry, and they can compensate income earners, uh, but they cannot exactly compensate everybody precisely for um, what they have to pay in the carbon tax. So what I say is almost correct, but not quite correct. It's approximately correct. Nobody, it, we can arrange things so that almost nobody is required to make a sacrifice. No class of people is required to make a sacrifice anyway. You still might be a bit puzzled by that. Um, it's a financial process, a financial process of borrowing and um, spending borrowing from um, present capitalists and spending on present future people. But what's needed is a movement of real consumption from people in the future back to people in the present. People in the present must not simply receive more money, they must actually be able to consume more goods. How does that happen? Well, if they have say lower income tax or they receive a subsidy, they spend their subsidy on present goods. And what that does is it diverts resources away from conventional investment, which will go through the future people, and bring them towards present uh, consumption. Um, and uh, so that involves a shift from future people to present. So all that shows that um, we will not in practice be able to implement a no sacrifice policy, as I'm suggesting, except by means of borrowing. But that poses a new problem. Many governments are not able to borrow any more than they do already. Even some governments that are well able to borrow are disinclined to do so. 
Uh, you know that many European countries, for example, have been imposing austerity on their people, even though they could easily instead have borrowed at a ludicrously low, low interest rate. They didn't think that borrowing was a good idea. Rather strikingly, in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, they've thrown off that attempt at fiscal probity. Fiscal conservatism has been thrown to the wind. And we hope now they're used to borrowing money in order to deal with a crisis. They might be persuaded to borrow more money in order to deal with a much greater crisis, which is climate change. Um, but whether they're willing to or not, this approach that I'm describing cannot be achieved without a new era of increased public debt. How can that be achieved? Well, we need a new international institution to make it possible for countries to borrow, even if they're not very credit worthy. Many countries, even if they would like to borrow, can't, they're not credit worthy. This is an institution that could be modeled on the World Bank, which was initially founded to provide finance for the world's recovery from the devastation of the Second World War. Let's call the institution the World Climate Bank. It would need to have great stability in order to be able to issue very long-term bonds because the policy of controlling climate change delivers its benefits very far in the future. This bank would have to have the committed support of those strong and powerful nations that are already able to issue very long-term public debt. I think this bank should be created. I think, in fact, this is where the international community should now divert its efforts away from appealing to morality towards creating a world climate bank that is able to make possible a no sacrifice response to climate change, since a no sacrifice response is the only one that I think can now uh, work. It's a response that, um, uh, that will then be um, uh, in the interest of everyone in the few present generation, and it will leave just as good resources for people in the future generation. It will remove the opposition that comes from the powerful fossil fuel interests, and those, they have to be removed. So that's the end. Yes. John, thank you so much for your talk. Could I ask you to please uh, stop screen yes. sharing your yes. slides? Thank you. Uh, um, that what? That's great. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, and we've got lots of questions already. Um, I would encourage anyone with a question to please type them into the uh, chat next to the YouTube live screen. We'll try and get through as many as possible. Uh, so first, um, I have a question Alice, here. Since over on. Alice, oh yes, is it, is it possible for me to see these questions or 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 not? Probably not. You're the only one who can see them. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, um, that's fine. I just I'll ask. I'll ask first one and then I'll work yeah. on a solution. <laughs> um, so since overconsumption, particularly in Western countries, is such an obstacle to necessary emissions reduction, isn't a certain amount of sacrifice, whether done voluntary or through forced policies, inevitable to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees targets? Uh, how do we communicate this necessary self-sacrifice in consumption and behavioural change in such a way that a critical mass of people in the population actually undertake those sacrifices? I missed, I think, the third word of that. You said, you said since a something or other, what was that? Since overconsumption, particularly over in Western countries. Since overconsumption, is that right? That's it, that's it. Okay. Uh, I wonder what overconsumption means. Um, presumably, it means consuming more than we ought to consume, I guess. So it's, it's a notion that already relies on having some moral theory about the consumption that we ought to be uh, doing. 
I'm, I'm not going to use that word, whether the consumption we're doing at the moment is overconsumption or not, um, it doesn't make any difference to the message that I was uh, offering, which is that we can change things in the economy in such a way that none of us have to make a sacrifice. That's to say, none of us have to be worse off than we would be. If overconsumption is doing us good, so that we're benefiting from our overconsumption, we can arrange things that, that we still get that same benefit. So the, the questioner, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, um, otherwise, uh, questioner, um, no, the, the message is that this is not necessary, as you assume that it was necessary. Um, uh, I really meant it when I said that none of us is required to make a sacrifice. If you think we're overconsuming, it may be because you think we'd be better off without consuming all that. And if that's so, then we won't have to have, you know, we can reduce our consumption and be better off. But if we can't be better off without maintaining the same consumption, then the message that comes from the theory is uh, we can do it. We can control climate change without demanding you. So just an update, um, I've managed to post the questions in the chat on our Zoom, so you should be able to see them now. So I'll post them one by the chat. Okay. And I'll, um, okay, so I'll read I see a quite a long question coming up. Is that the next one? <laughs> That's it's the a, next one. Have, yeah, it's good to have it written down there. Right. So... You talk a lot about the moral obligation to future generations, but what about the empathy gap that exists between people emitting the most in wealthy countries and those with the lowest per capita emission in developing countries who ironically experience the worst impacts of climate change? How can we, as people who won't necessarily be impacted directly by climate change, close the empathy gap that separate the higher emitters from those on the front line? Yeah, this is, this is another question from somebody who evidently doesn't believe my message. My message is that we do not have to achieve empathy from the better off. I don't think that they will have this empathy. We're not calling on any moral sacrifice from the better off people. There's no need to close any empathy gap. We bribe those better off people to accept the policy by making sure that they don't have to make a sacrifice in, for the sake of the less well-off people in the future and in the rest of the world. I, you know, I, I know this may seem a bit implausible, um, but nevertheless, it is true that we can deal with, we can remove the externality of climate change without calling for a sacrifice from anybody. Thank you. Um, next question. It's so it is hard because I uh, don't have the names for people asking the questions all the time. Uh, the next one is: so How does this intragenerational distribution look in practice? Say my preference is to gas guzzle. I guess uh, driving a gas guzzling car. You compensate me to refrain, but don't I use this compensation to do other emissions generating activities? Are there enough low carbon activities such that we can all do low emissions activities and be compensated for doing so? Right. Well, yes, the theory says so. Now, um, it may be that you, if you are a oh, petrol John, head, I've lost you there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yes, it's working perfectly. Um, if there is really nothing that will allow you to enjoy life, except driving around in a gas guzzling car, then I'm sorry to say, you're going to have to be allowed to continue to drive around in a gas guzzling car. And we are going to have to um, make sure that your emissions are canceled out by um, carbon capture and storage or by whatever other means we have of bringing uh, emissions down to zero. But most of us are not like that. Most of us enjoy more than one thing in life. Not many of us think that the only good thing in life is to drive around in a car. There are other good things that we can do. And some of them involve, in fact, all of them pretty much, 
involve lower levels of uh, carbon uh, emission. So um, this does this does require at least some of us to um, be able to do what economists call substitute. So we can substitute for some of the good things that we no longer get by other good things, which are enough to give us just as much um, uh, energy. It, a, a few people can refuse to substitute, um, but I, it certainly has to be that not the whole world can refuses to substitute. But there has to be quite a lot of substitution possible. And don't you think that that's possible? It seems to me that there are lots of good things that we can do that don't involve carbon emissions and that we can enjoy doing. Oh, and let me say, of course, one of the, the um, things worth mentioning is that we are adaptable. So in getting to enjoy life with less carbon consumption, that will involve some adaptation, so, which always happens when conditions of life change. We adapt to the conditions that we've got and we're just as happy in our new conditions. Um, so that's one way that, that these things are going to be possible. I would add in there, um, I suppose we're starting to see that with the response to COVID-19, uh, people have drastically changed their lifestyle and <laughs> hopefully it sticks. Yes, um, that's, that's a, um, I'm glad you mentioned it actually, because one of the things that I was hoping to say and didn't get a chance to say is now we have this new crisis. Things, we're learning a lot about the world. Um, and one of the things we're learning is that we can live our lives in different ways and actually we quite like it. So some of us are rather reluctant to return to work in uh, uh, offices. Um, so there's a lot of optimism around, you know, not optimism about COVID-19, but optimism about the possible benefits to climate change that will result from it. I'm cautious about that myself. Um, it seems to me quite possible that the, the powerful interests that I keep talking about will make sure that when we overcome this virus, we go back to living in just about the same way as we lived before, in very wasteful ways, continuing uh, emissions of greenhouse gas. I don't think that, we, that the lesson we've learned is going by itself to contribute very much to our dealing with the problem of uh, climate change. I do think we have to take um, separate action. So I'm not, an, I'm not that sort of an optimist uh, about the results of the um, coronavirus. Um, great. So the next question we've got is, um, right, so how local is the no sacrifice constraint? For example, over what period should we break even? What size of group should break even? Fossil fuel companies? Uh, do arguments, arguments might work better locally, uh, but the policy might be harder. Okay, well, the first thing is I'm not talking about companies. I'm talking about people. Mm -hmm. And how I was thinking was people's life I was thinking about people's lifetime well-being. So how good is the life of each person? And I was saying that it's possible to arrange things. So the lifetime goodness of each of us is just as good as it would otherwise be. And we deal with the problem of climate change. So it's not local. Um, I, yeah, it's not as, oh, I see, yes, I, I did, yeah, good point. Um, I, did, I did at the end qualify what I was saying. I, I said that uh, actually in practice, because governments cannot target their tax policies at individuals, it won't be possible, it won't be possible for every single individual to be made better off. This is just a practical difficulty about the design of tax policy down to the uh, local level. So you ask what size of group should break even? Well, I think the answer to that is the size of the group should, that should break even is the size of the smallest group that governments can specifically target 
in the design of their income tax or their, their tax system. Um, so, you know, you can, you can arrange particular taxes, shall we say, you can tax particular commodities that people buy. That gives you quite a refined sort of tax. So you can, or you can subsidize particular groups. So you can pick a group, um, shall we say, nursing mothers by subsidizing the sorts of things that nursing mothers need and other people don't need. So ta tax and subsidy policy can be quite well targeted, but, but, it, but um, that's the limit. It, you can target groups of a small size, but not individuals generally. So that fits in quite nicely um, to a question here, which is, what are some examples of practical or viable policies which will incentivize the sacrifice you refer to while being politically feasible and attractive? Um, so I suppose the, the ones you just mentioned would fall into so that, that category. This one hasn't come up, right? So, so what? No, I, yeah. I jumped the gun because it was relevant. Right. Okay. Um, so what policy, policy will sacrifice Sorry, incentivize the sacrifice I referred to. That, that was the question? Uh, yes, I've just posted it there on the, on the chat. Oh, what are some it. examples of practical or viable policies which will incentivize uh, the sacrifice you refer to while being politically feasible and attractive? Um, well, uh, Practical examples you can find, for example, in um, British Columbia. Uh, British Columbia has a carbon tax. Um, the way it was instituted was that there was a guarantee built into the law that any revenue raised from the carbon tax would be returned to the people by some means, either a reduction in other taxes or by subsidies of some sort. So it was by law made um, uh, revenue neutral. Um, and that actually has made the uh, carbon tax in British Columbia quite popular. So that's an example. Um, there, are, there are carbon taxes uh, around the world. Um, Sweden has actually really quite a high carbon tax and has had it since the early 90s. Um, uh, perhaps as a, as a remark about that, um, I saw a study of which governments have successfully um, managed to have a carbon tax and maintain it. So I'm sorry to say this doesn't include Australia, which had one and then lost it <laughs> within a few years, but countries that have carbon taxes and maintain them are the countries where on the whole, the people tend to trust their governments. So Sweden has had a carbon tax since the 1990s and measures of trust in government show that Sweden ranks quite high. British Columbia evidently the, the people trust their government too. So a trustworthy government is rather important for this. One of the reasons I suspect why people are so opposed to carbon taxes as they are in a lot of places is that they just think, they're, they think the government is out to get them they think that the government is just doing everything it can to take money off them, and the carbon tax is just another way of taking money away. Um, if you think that, then you're going to be opposed to uh, a carbon tax. But if you recognize that the government can make things better for you by using the revenue in other ways, um, and by reconstructing the economy in a greener way, um, then you will be willing to accept it. So carbon taxes are certainly politically feasible. Oh, that's fascinating. So um, the next one I've put here is, uh, so putting aside the non-identity problem, uh, which is a big thing to put aside, one objection to rapid action on climate change is that future generations will be richer and healthier with longer life expectancies than we have today. This is uncertain, but if indeed future generations are better off, but less well off than they could have been, have these future generations any justifiable appeal to have been wronged? Well, I'm not sure about the uh, appeal, but the policy that I'm recommending does not do this to them. 
the policy that I'm recommending gives them better resources than they would have had had we not done anything about climate change. So um, they are better, well, let's suppose that they're going to be better, richer, healthier with longer life expectation than we have. And we now implement a no sacrifice uh, policy to restrain climate change. Well, they're going to be even richer and healthier with even longer life expectancies than we have today. Or at any rate, they're going to have the resources that make that possible. I can't guarantee that they will be actually richer and healthier with longer life expectancies because that depends on what they are like. It depends on the number of future people that there are and what those people, um, the sort of people uh, that they are. So we can give them resources to make them better off. Can't guarantee that they actually will end up better off. This is, this is part of a, uh, of a way of, of, of thinking in political philosophy that has become common. Look at the resources rather than the well-being. Leave well-being to the people, but make sure it's called resources. Make sure that we give the people resources to give a good life, to have a good life. So, a question about the intragenerational maldistribution and your views on how this connects to discussions of finance for loss and damage. Sorry, was, was that a question? <laughs> I guess I would rephrase it as um, how would your views uh, on uh, intergenerational justice and maldistribution connect to um, or have implications for discussions of finance and loss and damage in particular? Finance and loss and damage what? I think finance for loss and damage. So loss and damage in the sense of there's mitigation, adaptation, and what is okay, being called so loss you're, and damage. You're using this word finance in the way that appears in some of the climate change um, business. Finance means that poor countries will be financed by rich countries for doing, for, for doing the climate, climate action that they need to do. Is, is that what you have in mind? Is, is that the meaning of finance? You know, I talked about how this is to be financed, is to be financed by borrowing. But I think you're thinking of finance in a different sense from me. Have I got you right? Um, I'm afraid it's not my question. Um, oh, so is, I'm I- Sorry. Ah. <laughs> that's all, all I can do is, is, is hazard so, a guess. I haven't seen this yet. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it, it did come up. Yeah, I think that must be that must be the implication of the of the questioner, right? Um, so uh, the the word finance has become code uh, in the climate change discussion for transfers from richer countries to poorer countries, and those transfers could be seen in two ways. One is as compensation for the harm that the richer countries are being are doing to the poorer countries. And the other is to finance the poorer countries uh, to allow them to do things which will avoid uh, emitting greenhouse gas that they otherwise would have done. So I think that's the idea of finance. So now I need to think what the answer to the question is. Um, well, I certainly stressed that there will have to be uh, transfers, um, intragenerational transfers, um, in, in order to make sure that nobody suffers as a result of um, doing something about uh, uh, climate change. Now, this may, that the direction of those transfers is uncertain because it depends how the policies develop, but it could well be that um, the, the poor people who at the moment will continue to suffer from the greenhouse gas will have to receive transfers to compensate them from, for the suffering that will continue. So that will be a transfer from the better off countries to the less well off. And the 
great benefit that can be achieved overall by reducing green, uh, by reducing climate change will allow resources to be available to make those transfers. So this is how I think that the policy would ideally develop. We would come together and agree that there will be a climate bank whose job is to finance um, uh, greenhouse gas investment, climate change, investment in climate change reduction, and it will be financed by loans. Um, and the, the benefits that will arise for this should, as far as possible, be granted to the poorer communities in the world. So some of the benefits will have to go to the rich, including the fossil fuel interest to compensate them for using their position. But any surplus benefits, and there will be many surplus benefits because climate, climate change is an extraordinary dis destroyer of well-being in the world, any surplus benefits available should be transferred to the poor. So it can mitigate the pres present um, inequality that there is in the world. So the benefits should really go to the current poor. They should, they should really, basically, the direction of transfer should be from the future rich to the present poor. So the next one is that your approach seems predicated on moral actors being individual persons. Uh, I'd be interested, or the, the person asking the question would be interested to hear, what do you think about the role of corporations, which are A, legal persons, and B, act in their own self-interest? So is a no sacrifice result possible if individuals include corporations as distinct entities from, for example, their CEOs and shareholders? I don't think so. Uh, at the moment, I can't think of any reason why it should be, but I, I have a rather unclear idea of the interests of a company. So, for example, the fossil fuel companies, it seems pretty clear, a good number of them, if they can't uh, change their stripes, they're going to have to be wound up. So we're going to be having to we'll have to do without um, many of the fossil fuel companies. Now that sounds to me like a bad thing for the company. Um, it's, it's having its life cut short. Uh, so I think it's unlikely that if we if we really develop a useful notion of the interests of a company, that we can protect the interests of all the companies. All, all the actors who are not persons. I was only talking about persons. And my claim is that all persons can, um, no person has to make a sacrifice. So you've said that the government can transfer money to future people, to present people by borrowing. Uh, but does government borrowing not just transfer resources between individuals at any given point of time? Uh, so perhaps could you say a bit more about what's going on in the background there? Yeah, yeah this, this is definitely tricky and um, uh, I'm not sure that I can make it perfectly clear in a short time. But as I said, a government debt is a commitment to raise taxes on future people. So this is, this is how the transfer of real goods from future people to present people takes place through government borrowing. There is, as you say, I mean, initially, borrowing and repaying a loan is simply a transaction between people who are contemporaneous. You can't literally borrow from future people. What happens when you, the government takes out debt is that a number of present people or a com com community of present people are taking money from a number of, 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 of present people. So there's a transfer within the generation. But this transfer can affect how real things happen in the economy. So if the government borrows, 
current cap capitalists, that's to say, are willing to pay the government in order to allow, give it the resources that it can then pay to present people, present people will then go out and spend the money that they've been given. And they will be buying things. Now, this is something that's happening in reality in the present. So this is in the real part of the economy. They will be buying things. Where will they get the things to buy? Well, they will get them because the capitalists are no longer buying so many things for their investment activity. So the capitalists have handed over the finance to the government. The government has gotten into the hands of present consumers who are now buying things. And that means that what the, the, the real investment that was taking place, going to take place, is now being transferred into the pockets, into the, into the homes of the people who have received the revenue raised by the loan. So investment for the future is being reduced, and that means that fewer goods will now be available for future people. So that's the way that the reality, the financial transaction in the present gets to have a real effect that um, leaves future people with less, with fewer resources than they otherwise would have had. So this might already have been answered slightly, but how is it possible to demarcate the present population that's sacrificed by paying carbon taxes from future generations that will supposedly compensate through their taxes? Where do you draw that boundary? Well, in my theorem, it's the people who are living at the moment who I count as the present people, not the and anybody who is not. Oh, no, that's not right. Not anybody. The people who are living at the, at the present and the people who will live at some point, whatever we do. So there may be some commitments to the existence of particular future people. But those are the people that, that come into the theorem. Now, so there's the answer to the question. Let me just have a look at what the significance of this is. Um, Yeah, so anybody who doesn't, who is not yet alive and whose existence is not already committed will count as one of the future generations and they will supposedly compensate them through their taxes. Uh, yes, in a sense, but I wouldn't expect that the ones who um, come into existence in a year or two to be the ones who are really doing it in a big way. The ones that I expect to be doing it in a big way are the ones who will be living in a couple of hundred years. Um, when the um, major effects of saving the world from climate change will be, will be um, coming through. So the next question we've got here is, to what extent do you think the no sacrifice approach will increase existent inequalities between lower classes and bigger companies? Well, that's a good question. Can, can I just change this from big companies to um, owners of big companies? Because I really don't want to talk about companies as having interests. I want to talk about the people who own them. What effect will it have on um, existing inequalities between the, the lower classes by, by which I will count the poorer people? There seems to be a within a particular society rather than interna international sort of um, uh, a distribution that we're talking about. Well, I think the answer there is that it's um, this is th th there is freedom in this. So remember, this is a thing always to bear in mind that if we can control climate change, the benefits of doing so are huge, and they will leave a surplus of resources, in effect, a surplus of wealth that can be used in some way or other. Those surplus resources will be distributed somewhere or other among the people in the world, the present people and the future people in the world. And the theory says nothing about how they're going to be um, distributed. The theory says we, we should have a no sacrifice solution. So none of those people should be made better off. 
of worse off, sorry, none of them should be made worse off, but how the surplus is going to be distributed, if it's going to go to the rich or going to go to the poor, I'm afraid that's something that the, the theory says nothing about. And that's going to have to be left to the individual governments and the international community to, to arrange. Now, I, I mean, I, I must say that I think the preferable thing, I said it just now, is for the, the transfer basically to go from the future rich to the present poor. And that will leave the poor better off and um, the rich no better off. They've got to be equally as well off, but no better off. So that would, that would reduce inequality. But that's not within the control of the structure of no sacrifice. So next we've got um, two questions which I'll put together because the second is a, a comment on the first. So we mentioned the example of Australia uh, and the no sacrifice constraint, but isn't there the possibility of an implicit sacrifice since developing countries might have had the chance to develop economically through emissions? Isn't it fair that they have the chance to pollute so as to develop economically speedily? Um, comment on that question was additionally it seems predicated on a decision theory that denies the correlated decision principle or at least the infeasibility of convincing people of the truth of it. So you've put them together I think I want to take them separately. <laughs> um, uh, so can so we, we're comparing Australia as in the first question. We're comparing Australia with the um, presently um, underdeveloped countries, right? Developing countries might have the chance to develop economically through emissions. Isn't it a fair that they have to chance the chance to pollute so as to develop economically speedily? Well, yes, um, it may be fair. Fairness is not actually my criteria. Um, uh, you, you know, anything that we do to achieve fairness goes beyond my criteria. My only criterion is that there should be no sacrifice. We do, I mean, we surely do think it's fair that um, uh, developing countries should have the chance to develop and catch up uh, with the rich. And so we do think that the surplus of resources that I keep saying will be available should be used to allow the poorer countries to develop economically. Now, does that mean by polluting? Well, I think it might do. If it were, if it's so that the early stages of development cannot be conducted without emission of greenhouse gas, that means that we are. It will be, if, that, if that were so, that the developing countries should, as you might say, get an allowance of greenhouse gas in order to uh, develop economically. And according to, um, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there is still a sort of allowance of greenhouse gas uh, to be had. There's um, uh, a couple of hundred billion tons that can still be emitted well, actually, that's without breaching the two degree target rather than the 1.5 degree target. But at any rate, it does, there's, there's nothing that says in order to achieve a no sacrifice solution, development has to stop in the developing countries. Development might continue. And if that's the only way in which the people who live in those countries can avoid being made worse off, then it must be, it must continue. Um, yes, it's fair, and um, it, it certainly will have to continue if it's the only way for it to happen. So I think I'm, I'm, the question is, isn't it fair that they have the chance to pollute? Well, my answer is yes, if there isn't any way they can develop without emitting greenhouse gas. And I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, bear in mind that the context we're in now is where um, new installations of uh, solar power are actually cheaper than coal-fired um, power stations. Uh, so um, it's not obvious that um, greenhouse gas polluting activities are the way that developing countries now have to develop. Uh, it may well be that we can simply 
get away, do away with coal fired power stations even today. Right, now for the second question, I'm sorry to say, I can't answer it because I don't know what the correlated decision principle is. So whoever asks the question is going to have not only to convince me of the truth of it, but to tell me what it is. But we're probably not going to get that, are we, I'm afraid? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I can try and- Do you know and what it is, Alice? Can you tell me? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, but perhaps the person who comment who posted the question will come back with their follow up comment. Okay. Um, but for the next one, um, and I'm just bearing in mind we've got about 15 minutes left, or or 12 actually. So, are some of the net benefits which will accrue from your propo uh, proposal actually an absence of disbenefits? If so, how can we how can these be dealt with? Yeah, they are an absence of disbenefits, undoubtedly. Um, so what I was counting as a benefit, for example, is the fact that future generations will not have to deal with a highly polluted atmosphere, an atmosphere polluted by greenhouse gas. That would be very disbeneficial to them. So if we do nothing, people living in 100, 150 years will be suffering a lot from the greenhouse gas, and we're going to save them from that. And I was counting that as a benefit. So that, that's really the answer. How can they, these be dealt with? Well, they're being dealt with by being taken away, by being, it's an absence of them. Um, we're, we're preventing those disbenefits from occurring. Or actually, even not really, we're reducing them, is all I can say. People are being made better off, made better off because they are suffering less of a disbenefit than they otherwise would have been if we hadn't done something about climate change. So what, in your opinion, is um, a just discount rate? We're talking about our relationship between generations, um, which seem to be reflected by our discount rate. But what would be the just rate? Right. Um, we could go on for hours about this. Uh, so, but, and the first thing that has to be said is, when you talk about the discount rate, you have to say what that discount rate is being calculated on. Do you mean a discount rate on future economic commodities, manufactured goods, or even economic resources? Or do you mean a discount rate on people's welfare or well-being? That second one is what economists often call a pure discount rate. And if you use it, what that means is that you're counting future people's well-being, how good their lives are, you're counting that for less than the goodness of the lives of present people. So that's, that's, that's a, using a pure discount rate. If you have a discount rate on commodities, which is the thing that actually gets into economists' um, cost-benefit analysis, that does not necessarily imply that you're discounting future people's well-being. So let me stick to oh, uh, those two things, discount rate on well-being and discount rate on future uh, economic products. Now, I myself think that there's no good case for having a pure discount rate. There have been some arguments offered um, most recently that the, the person who offered, that the most prominent economist who favored a pure discount rate is Ken Arrow. And there have been some other arguments um, uh, about this. Um, there are certainly are some arguments and they need to be answered, but I think they can be answered and I think we should not accept a pure discount rate. On the other hand, discount rate on commodities is, it seems to me, exactly right. Um, so long as the economy is growing, future commodities are genuinely less valuable than present commodities, because if the economy is growing, future commodities come to people who are better off. And commodities to better off people are worth less, are less valuable than commodities to present people. So um, uh, that's what I think about the discount rate. I don't necessarily call it a just rate. I think that we're talking about quantities of benefit rather than justice. But I think the correct pure discount rate is zero, 
the correct discount rate on commodities is, is complicated, but it's going to be, if the economy is growing, it's going to be positive. So how do we make sure that parties contribute sufficiently to the World Climate Bank? And what does this require from a legal and institutional point of view? Well, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I, I, think, I think we have to use the World Bank as, as a model. So the, um, the bigger surviving, the, the, the countries that survived the Second World War in a better state than the ones that didn't backed the World Climate Bank, sorry, the World Bank, which had the remit of providing finance to countries around the world that had been devastated and needed to borrow money to rebuild their uh, economies. It could do that because it was backed principally by the United States. It really has to be the United States and China, I guess, that support uh, this bank. Europe, if it continues to survive, we need, we need the big powerful economies uh, to do it. And they have to make a commitment. I mean, committing to, to support loans is um, definitely uh, an undertaking. It's a risk. They will have to accept the risk, but it's not a very great risk when you have these big powerful economies who are only asked to support debts from poor countries that need to borrow something in order to develop in a green way. So the next question is on the World Bank, uh, the World Climate Bank too, a critical question. Has it been discussed with policymakers yet? Is it on the cards? Um, not so far as I know, I don't actually have access to policymakers. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm an academic and I'm a philosopher. Philosophers are extremely uninfluential. Un so the best I can do is propagate the idea. This is, this is what we do in philosophy. Um, and philosophy is in fact, by doing this, is a very powerful, um, uh, it's a very powerful discipline. The way, the way that philosophers thought um, some millennia ago or some centuries ago have influenced extremely strongly the way that our world is now structured, but it, it has taken a long time. The way, the, the way they influence people is by talking, um, uh, writing books and so on, which people with some practical power gradually get to know about and, um, and register. Uh, we don't normally, I mean, we're not like economists who get um, employed as consultants by governments. Um, we don't. Uh, so, and, and I'm no different from anybody else in that respect. So I'm afraid I don't have, I don't have the influence. All I can do is things like this and, and hope, you know, occasionally I do public lectures on this and hope that somebody who has got influence will pick it up. So I think that's a perfect note to end on uh, about thinking about how philosophers can best contribute to the, you know, the climate change discourse, uh, discussion and action about it. And I think your talk really demonstrated that uh, perfectly. It dealt with all these issues that are on the ground um, and laid them out in a way for us to think about clearly. Uh, so I really wanted to thank you for joining us and apologize to anyone in the audience whose question I didn't get to. Uh, there are a lot more um, to go on, but we, <laughs> we, we can't stay here for hours. Um, thank you to everyone who asked a question and to everyone who joined. And I hope to see you in two weeks time on June 3rd for Dr. Megan Bonfield's talk on climate responsibilities in an unjust world. Thank you. So can I add my thanks too? And if you do have questions, you can by all means, email them to me. I'm afraid I don't necessarily guarantee to answer them quickly, but I will do my best to answer them sometime in the future. You can get my email address from somewhere, presumably.
website. Um, on my website, look up John Broom on the web. That's great. And what I might do, this video will be uh, made available online um, and I'll send that out to everyone who registered. And I can also um, put down all the questions into a sheet uh, for anyone to see. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you, John.